Uh, thank you, Amanda, for the introduction. Uh, I'm excited to talk a bit about the research I plan to conduct here in the coming years. So let me dive right into it. Uh, in 1908, the brilliant scientist John Scott Haldane discovered a way to prevent the bends, an illness that had long been the bane of people whose work necessitated being underwater. The bends, also known as decompression sickness, is something that causes paralysis in submerged bodies that rise too quickly from the water surface uh, to the water surface. From his seat at Oxford, the intellectual heart of a global empire, this man of science indirectly saved countless of lives while opening new avenues in underwater exploration. But decades earlier, a fisherman in Japan had arrived at exactly the same conclusions as Haldane. Without access to any state-of-the-art equipment or laboratories, this fisherman devised his own method to prevent the bends, and it came to be widely adopted among fellow fisherfolk. Nobody remembers this, but an ordinary fisherman had beaten an Oxford intellectual in developing the world's first prophylactic against decompression sickness. The point I'm making is not that we need to date some scientific discovery differently or that the great men of history often overshadowed the little and the non-men. Instead, I'm talking here about the exclusion of whole systems of knowledge from the history books. The fisherman's life-saving method was the product of a highly localized knowledge of nature developed through centuries-long dialogue with the sea. Unlike Haldane's discovery, it was a form of knowledge that didn't necessarily contribute to a process of scientific and industrial modernization that transformed the world, hence its erasure from history. But what it did contribute to was the creation of an entirely different kind of world for which history has not made much space. So my book project is about this world, uh, a time and place that doesn't exist as an area in area studies uh, or on the maps of global and world history. I call this the Arafura zone. And between the 19th and 20th centuries, migrant fisher folk, indigenous people, and all kinds of vagrants from all across the Western Pacific began to converge here in search of autonomy and freedom from modern empires. These were non-state actors who played peripheral roles in their respective national histories. I'm talking about Japanese craft evaders, uh, Manila men with contested relations to Manila and Malays, Melanesians, and Aboriginals, who we only seem to be able to refer to in history in a way that locks them into a racial hierarchy institutionalized by civilized nation states. And so these people collectively turned to the ocean, which they saw as an intellectual common ground. They used their local knowledge of nature not to achieve mastery over it, but rather to live outside of dichotomous and hegemonic structures of industrial and capitalist modernity. And so in the process, they turned East Asia, Southeast Asia, Australia, and Oceania into one continuous area of transnational coexistence and mutual aid. And so looking at the history of this supposedly non-existent area and its missing peoples uh, offers, I think, deeply non-colonial and non-Eurocentric understandings of such terms as science, civilization, and freedom terms that have long been confined to notions of historical progress within Western civilizational discourse. So the Arfura zone thereby constitutes one site through which we might begin to rethink some of these major concerns that have preoccupied historians and highlight forgotten imaginations of the future that we're desperately looking for in the present. <laughs> 